Hey guys, welcome back to another Default Cube CG Matter tutorial, aka the most handsome guy on the scene when it comes to Blender tutorials. And today, I want to talk about something. Let me just make sure the camera is where it's supposed to be. Uh, today, I want to talk about something that might be a bit strange. It has to do with nodes, and specifically, I want to kind of go on a in-depth rant, in-depth discussion about this node right here, which is called RGB Curves. Now full screen. Now you node professionals already know the value of this node. It literally lets you draw stuff like visual, visually graph things. But a lot of people who aren't used to nodes, who maybe saw level one of the shading node series, which eventually I might continue, uh, might see this and think, okay, I don't know what the big deal about this is. Why is it better than something like a uh, color ramp? If anything, it just looks more confusing. And I put up a simple, I made a simple demo file to illustrate what the power of this is. So here I have a simple graph, a simple RGB curves with this kind of downward slope, which you can see right here. And I've done some interesting mirroring to have it copy on all four sides to make a square. And to do this, it's actually a very small node graph. I want to explain this in detail. Everything there's to know about graphing, we're going to go in depth. But the power of this is, check this out, I'm just going to manipulate this and we have this kind of like weird bumpy circle thing. You could have a star and visually you can just graph things that would be very hard to do with math nodes. I mean, if you knew what you were doing, you could put these formulas together using math nodes, but it's not very visual. So again, just to reiterate, uh, this curve you're seeing here, the one that I drew, it's in this corner of the plane, right? It's the exact same curve but I just duplicated it to make it a interesting like region instead of whatever it was before. And we can also control kind of like the fall off of this. So here we have a nice sharp look. So I'm just going to be talking about the theory of that in depth. Let's get started. If anything, this is like level two of the shading node series, just not officially. So uh, here we have Blender open. Let's go to the shading workspace since this is where we need to work. All of this works in Eevee. Works in cycles should be identical since we're just... Uh, basically creating functions. There's no shading, BSDF nonsense that we need to care about. I'm gonna make a material. I'm gonna call this RGB curves demo. And I guess before we do RGB curves, I just wanna go in detail with graphing so you understand the theory of how to put whatever you want on here. And then we can have that arbitrary manipulation using the RGB curve. So pay attention. You're gonna learn some node theory if you haven't you know, learned it already. We're going to start off with a texture coordinates node, and let's visualize this. By the way, I'm using Node Wrangler to do that quick viewing. It's an add-on. You can enable it. I'm using generated coordinates, which we can separate because right now you, you see this kind of weird colorful gradient and you might not know what's going on. We're going to take this three-dimensional quantity, which is, you know, these coordinates, and separate them into X, Y, and Z components. So when we look at the X component, you can see we're going from left to right, a gradient from left to right along the X axis. That's why it's that instead of up to down, starting at zero, going to one. With the Y axis, it's, you know, bottom to top, because that's the Y axis, zero to one. Z axis isn't really going to make much sense because generated coordinates are generated by the bounding box of the object. And in this case, you know, the plane's infinitely thin. So it's kind of occupying the same uh, Z coordinate, right? You could kind of make it make more sense if it's a box. Now Z zero to one actually makes sense. But here I believe it's using the value 0.5 because it's in the middle of the bounding box. I'm not sure. Uh, but the point is we care about X component, Y component, and UV coordinates give us the same thing because the UV coordinates of this plane are just the, is this the UV, UV editor? Uh, yeah, it's just the um, plane itself. It's taking up the whole region, so it's the same thing. Okay, so let's go to top view. So we have X and Y coordinates, which means that we can probably graph things because that's the way you normally do it. Just think about school, like Y equals X squared, Y equals X cubed, Y equals the logarithm of X plus one. These all have to do with Y and X, and we have both of these. So let's consider making a very simple function. How do I draw something like X squared, which is a parabola, right? Well, to do that, we need to calculate x squared. So just a math node, very intuitive stuff. x squared is either multiplica multiplication of x times x, that's x squared, or it is x to the power of 2. And this is kind of more convenient because we could say x squared, x cubed, all with changing the exponent. And you can see all this really did is change the gradient. We had uh, this before, just a x uh, y, just like a x thing from 0 to 1. We're, we're visualizing x get larger as we go from left to right. And now we're doing the same thing, but with a 
function kind of in between of x squared. So it's just a gradient manipulated by x squared. Okay. Um, that's nice, but we want to actually see the parabola. Where does that come in? Well, think about it like this. When you're in school and you're looking up at a parabola, you're thinking, oh, it's x squared, but it's not. It's where y is equal to x squared, meaning we somehow need to compare x and y. Right now, we're only looking at the x coordinate, so somehow we need to get y involved. And if we want the actual graph of the thing, or at least something that approximates it, we just need to see where they're equal. In other words, we need to compare them. So I'm going to take another math node, set this to compare. Let me, let me take these headphones off. They serve no purpose. They just make a noise. So let's compare x squared, which is feeding into the first value, and let's compare y. And right now, you might be seeing a very, very thin line if YouTube compression doesn't kill it. Um, and th these are where they're equal within a threshold, an epsilon of zero, which doesn't really make sense. It needs to be at least some slightly positive number, which I'm assuming that's what's happening under the hood. But we can make this a bit bigger to visualize the line's thickness. And you can see that now we have uh, y equals x squared. And you're thinking, okay, I'm seeing the parabola, but it's not the full thing. It's, it doesn't look like a u. And that's because our coordinates are generated. They start at the origin 0, 0, and then we're going x-axis, y-axis. There is no negative x that we need on the left for the symmetry of the parabola. We can either recover that by using object coordinates, which centers the origin on the origin right here. So now we see the full parabola. And we could do like, you know, x cubed, x to the fourth, x to the fifth, right? Just graphing stuff. You could even do like a square root curve, which looks like this, which has a uh, discontinuity for negative numbers because, you know, that's where imaginary numbers come in. But we could graph whatever we want. Um, we could either recover this, like I was saying, by object coordinates, or if you're very insistent on generated coordinates, let's just think about what we need to do. Well, we need to shift it along the x-axis. So we can just do a vector addition, vector math, set to add, and we just want to manipulate this uh, x slider. So to go left, you go negative. To go right, you go positive. And now we're kind of scanning the graph. But let's just keep it on the top right quadrant. You might be thinking, and I know this is very mathematical, but hopefully you can handle it because it's, it's important, right? And we can't talk about RGB curves until we talk about graphing. Um, you might be thinking why is the thickness of this line kind of different? Like it's very thick over here and then it gets thin. And that's because we're comparing by a constant number um, you'd need to know the slope of this function, which in fact is very simple to calculate. It's just a derivative. It's 2x in this case, but um, yeah, you'd need to know the slope and make a function for the thickness of this line to have it be even thickness, but that's not what we care about. Uh, what is interesting is we don't necessarily need to compare using a compare. We can just say, instead of saying where's y equal to x squared or very nearly, why don't we say where's y less than x squared or greater than, and that will give us the region above or below the parabola. And in some sense, that's better than this uh, uneven thickness thing. So we could either do a less than or a greater than. Let's try it less than. Well, now we have the area above the parabola because this is where I believe x squared is less than y. I always get confused about the order, but uh, we can always invert this with a greater than. These are kind of opposite uh, operations, opposite, way to, opposite ways to compare things. And this, of course, works when we visualize the whole parabola. So now you can really see what's going on over here. Hey guys, sorry for the very quick interruption. This is me from the future just saying that I have a video course out. If you're interested in motion tracking a hand and putting a fleshy hole in it and having me talk about it for two and a half hours in a very, very detailed video course, that quite frankly is very cheap. There are links in the description for you where you can get that. Uh, sorry for this interruption. Just wanted to mention it. I don't want to take up too much time. So back to the what we're doing. And this works again with any kind of graph. So x cubed, x to the fourth, and you know, whatever you want. Stuff like, uh, what else is interesting here? We got inverse square root. I guess that isn't interesting. What about square root? I think we already talked about that one. Any function you can put in here works, which is why, wow, that was loud, uh, which is why RGB curves is going to be relevant in a second because we're not going to use a math node right here, we're, we're gonna use an RGB curves as our function. But you could either do a, you know, an inequality comparison, or we could just do, and this is a trick I learned from Simon Thomas, although it's inherently obvious, but he's the one I saw do it, so credit to him. Instead of doing a comparison like this, we could just set it to subtract, and then we get this nice gradient, because we're kind of comparing them in the same way as before, but now we're kind of getting the distance away, which gives us this nice fall off. And you might be thinking, okay, subtraction, 
Uh, shouldn't these be negative numbers in that case? And they are, and that's why they're black. Anything under zero is set to black. You could clamp to kind of round these up to zero. But if you kind of ignore this area, it gives us a very, very nice fall off. Works for any exponent. Okay, so now we know how to compare these things. You can later use a compare greater than, less than, or subtraction. And you can always swap these with subtract to kind of get the same effect as less than, greater than. And already we can make some interesting shapes, but I say, I say, why don't we uh, bring in the RGB curves, which is the topic of this video. So again, the idea here is we don't want to be making our functions in a very mathematical, rigid sense where we need to know the exact formula. What about instead we put in an RGB curves, which looks like this. We're going to take our X and plug it in here. Kind of like, this is kind of like the replacement for our math node. And now you can see that we have this function, which is literally being drawn out. If we go like this, it does the same thing. And you might be thinking, okay, that's fine. But here's what I need you to think about. We now have a way to visually uh, make any shape we want. So even if there's something you don't know how to describe, like a function like this, now we've drawn it. And if we want something sharp, we could do a greater than, less than. If we want a uh, thin line, compare by something, some uh, amount. And again, we need to consider the slope if you want even thickness. Although if you make it super thin, it will be less noticeable, right? Let's go back to subtract. Uh, we now have complete control over this and we can always reset it, do a inverse kind of thing like this. And the way you want to think about this, like you could either think about it as whatever you're drawing is popping on the plane. Or another way to think about it is X goes from zero to one, which is, you know, going along here. And then we're kind of saying, what do we uh, map those values to? Which with this network where we're comparing X and Y visually shows it on the plane. So let me just make a, I don't know, something like this. So this is already a super powerful technique. You can use it to make uh, kind of, it's kind of like beveling in a shading. You can use this to make profiles and everything. Uh, but how do we do that thing I was showing earlier where we don't just have this region, but we put that in the first quadrant and we copy it. We mirror it um, on all four quadrants. Well, one way to start off is you could use object coordinates and you might be thinking, okay, what happened here? Well, with object coordinates, this is the origin, meaning that this quadrant, the top right quadrant is what we had before. So this curve is kind of now in the top quadrant. And then everything else is behaving weirdly because on this quadrant, we have um, positive Y values and X is going negative as we go left. On the bottom left, we have negative X and negative Y. And on the right, we have positive X and negative Y. So somehow we need to take this region, this um, corner, this first quadrant and make sure that all the others behave the same. And I've kind of already given you the hint on how to do that, right? We want X going positive as we increase and same with Y. Um, and the issue is that some of these other quadrants have negative stuff going on. So if we could do absolute value, uh, that would fix it because that would mirror this one to all four. It's kind of like for this quadrant, it will flip it and then we'll flip it again for the others. So let's just do a vector math. And we're going to set this to absolute, which takes the absolute value for X, Y, and Z. If you wanted to do this the long way, you could either separate and combine, and then do X, Y, and Z. And then in between here, you'd throw a math node for each one of these set to absolute, right? And it would give the same thing, just to illustrate. So same thing. And I guess we could skip a Z component, right? Uh, because of that thing we were talking about earlier. But vector math is the way to go, set to absolute. And now you can see that this is mirrored. So we have it here, and then we flip it, and flip it, and flip it which means we can get very, very interesting designs pretty quickly. So let's just reset this. And I'm thinking right now it's kind of giving us these weird shapes. We want it to have an interior. So let's uh, slope it. Let's slope it the other way. Because now what we have is a triangle. Again, we're looking at regions since we're doing subtraction more obviously with the greater than, less than. Uh, we have a triangle in the first quadrant and when we copy it, it will make an, make an enclosed shape. So we can now make all these very interesting regions that'd be very hard to do manually. Especially stars. This is super useful for stuff like stars and stuff like this, where we just take our center point and manipulate it like this. Uh, you don't need to have a curve if you want a sharp thing. I think it is vector handle. Yes, and now we've created a um, octagon. 
You could go even further like this, make it a dodecagon. We'd need to vector handle these boys. And this is an interesting way to create <laughs> create shapes as well. It's like procedural, maybe not the most efficient way, but like already you have access to all these shapes uh, you wouldn't have before just with RGB curves. So really the point of this tutorial was to understand how, understand how to put me into full screen. It was to understand how to make a graph and compare X, whatever function we put to X and Y on the node editor, and also visualize these as regions, as comparisons, as subtractions, whatever, and also mess around with the RGB curve so we could do this very arbitrarily. And I guess one more thing I want to talk about, I, I don't think I did, although I did before, I just didn't make it obvious. So let me just reset this. Make sure that I'm in the right region. Uh, let me just reset this to uh, the thing we had. Greater than is going give to give us this nice sharp thing. Um, subtraction is going to give us a nice fall off, which might be interesting if you're using this as a displacement map. It will give us a nice cone, I believe. And then compare should give us the outline of this. It might look a bit weird, but you can see how it actually works out fairly well when we have a linear thing. When we curve it, we, we have those issues from before. But... Maybe I'll make a video about that. You could make an interesting carpet this way. Okay, let me let me get back to what I was saying. So, so that's the point of this tutorial. I know I haven't con continued Shader Nodes series, the official one, level two in a while. I'm thinking about it. I, I kind of just want to make videos like this instead of uh, structuring it, because structuring it makes it not fun. Either way, I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. If you did, the best way to support me is via Patreon. Uh, you could subscribe and all that, but Patreon is the one that really helps. Um, you could see it as a donation or you could see it as what you get. There are benefits like Discord access, like private video courses, which is a new one. I just started a, a new video course that I've uploaded. It's done uh, with putting a like a fleshy hole in your hand with motion tracking and somehow extrapolating or somehow recovering the data behind your hand. Um, there's also behind the scenes and all this. So Patreon is the best way to show your support. I highly appreciate anybody who's willing to do that. There is a, um, I don't want to flip my camera out the window to kind of dox where I am, but there's a cardinal outside. It's very pretty. Um, Patreon, <laughs> Patreon is the best way to support me. Pick up a video course, pick up whatever. Um, I hope, I hope you, you got the value you wanted out of this free tutorial and that's it. Thank you for watching.